This is Austin Veal. If you don't know who he is, um, for for many years, Austin has worked with different churches. He had his own worship school in uh, Florida, and uh, he was with Benny Hinn Ministries for how many years? A bunch? Nine years. So this guy is one of the most amazing uh, musician worshipers, lovers of God. Uh, the, the, and good looking. Yeah. And I just love this guy. We've just got to know each other pretty well. Um, just extend your hands toward him. He's had root canal surgery, if, uh, sinus infections, major, major issues the last while. So we let's just, Father, we just ask for strength for Austin tonight. Lord, just impart to him. Just, just move through him tonight, God. We just thank you for this man of God and Lord, what you're going to speak through him tonight to us. Jesus' name. Thank you, guys. Let me grab this stool here. I see a lot of familiar faces. Boy, we're going into this whole production here, aren't we? I said, man, if we got a dry erase board, that'd be nice. It didn't have to be this big a deal, but thank you, guys. That'll work. Yeah. That'll work. You got insurance, right, Pastor? In case you fall through. You got healing. <laughs> I want to thank the worship team for bringing the presence in. That was beautiful. I needed some soaking tonight. It was awesome. The faces in here that I recognize are people that I've seen that are like worship and music nuts, like myself. Um, you know, if I get a little bit of loopy, somebody like bring me back around to whatever the point was, because I'm like, have you ever heard of hydrocodone? I took an extra dose for tonight. And when my buzzer goes off, i got to take another one. I'll be writhing on the floor like I was most of the last 30 hours. So um, bear with me. Who in here would say, Austin, I love worship, but I'm really into something else besides music. I mean, I love music, but I'm not really a music person. I'm something else. One, two, three, four, five. So six, seven. Mostly talking to music people. If, if, if you raised your hand and said, I'm kind of a dance person. Uh, put your hand back down and, and um, everybody else. If you're not a dance or a music person. Okay, so where are you? Um, art, writing, journalism, photography. Beautiful. And, and yourself? Oh, okay. you yeah. Know, well, I just wanted to be here. Oh, that's beautiful. That's totally beautiful. <laughs> so we're mostly talking to music people, and I'm a music guy. So um, let me establish a couple of language things first. If I say musician... I'm also meaning singers. So all you singers that hear me talk about the bass player and the drummer all the time, don't feel excluded, totally to me. And if I'm saying musician, I'm really for the benefit of tonight, meaning artist, meaning all of us, meaning we're dancers, we're doing whatever it is that we do. Now, would it be all right if we, turn, if I ditch the mic? Is that gonna be okay for recording? How about, is this okay? Can y'all hear me all right? Would that mess you guys up? Is that all right if you would? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to hand this over to Greg. And if y'all if y'all need to, I'll gladly grab the mic again, but this just feels a little bit more normal, just us and all together. Can you just move closer? Yeah, if you can't hear, move closer, Greg says. <laughs> We've got a lapel mic. Oh, no, it was mostly the sound. I, just, okay. I prefer this if you can. Okay. Um, thank you. Oh, look, they're moving closer. Y'all are so sweet and <laughs> accommodating. Well, my heart is full tonight. I have um, somewhere around 60 hours worth of teaching that would apply to people like you guys. Wow. So uh, we're not going to do, not even going to try to show all 60. I, I've got a broad overview of an idea I want to share with you tonight. And, uh, and maybe we might poke some holes into some stinking thinking that we've all descended into tonight. That's kind of my heart. Um, if you've got something to write with, I'd go ahead and pull it out. Uh, and, and if it's okay with Greg, I'd also like to ask you to repeat something after me and do, do this. Um, everybody look at me real quick, just eyes forward like a classroom teacher. <laughs> okay, repeat after me. After. Repeat after me. Yeah. 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 The only stupid question, the only stupid question, question is the one I don't ask. Is the one I don't ask. ask. Now I'm up here and I've got some notes and I've got some things I want to share, but I really want you to Raise your hand and ask me questions. I really want this to be a, as much of a discussion as it is anything else. So please don't hesitate. I just saw you. It's so good to see you guys. 
Don't hesitate to ask. Don't hesitate to jump in with a comment. My favorite times in this, when somebody says, well, you know, Austin, you just said this, but this scripture over here completely contradicts you. Bing, 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 bing. And I go, thank God, now I'm learning. Okay? Because we're all in this together. So please ask questions, jump in, make some comments. Um, I've been doing this music thing for a long time. I've been um, taking piano lessons for 36 years. I still take piano lessons. Been a professional musician for 22, 23 years. I don't stop growing, but I don't stop growing be, from the from the standpoint of the church asking me to. Because I find that the church has a pretty low bar of acceptance. Okay, now hear me out. Not anti-church. Love the church or wouldn't be here tonight. But I find that if we're able to make somebody's hair stand up on their on their arm and feel some goosebumps, then worship was just great. Mm -hmm. And it's rare that the bar is ever set higher than that. Mm -hmm. Now some pastors would say, what possible bar could there be higher than the presence of God? Because isn't that what we're all here for? And I say there are deeper things. Okay? Ooh. Feel free to correct my bad theology afterwards, guys. I'm, don't, you know, don't, don't mind me at all. I think there are deeper things to travel. Now, if you look historically as it relates to art, I'm going to use a lot of terminology about art and artists tonight on purpose because you guys have heard all the worship people talk. And you've heard all the worship teachings. And everybody else talks about the spirit and the anointing and the presence. But I'm going to talk to you tonight about art and how that relates to the tabernacle of David and why it's a really big thing right now. Okay. Historically, the church understood back in the day how important art was, how important creativity submitted to the Holy Spirit unto the Lord was. Most of the great art was funded by the church. Many of the great artists were patronized and, and, and given a, a, a venue and a, a platform by the church. And something happened, I think, in America in the late 1800s that was a very prophetically symbolic shift. As America's culture has invaded the world's culture in the 1900s, right before that started in the late 1800s, we as the American church made a fundamental shift as it related to artists. And what we started to say was, these sounds are acceptable, but these sounds are not acceptable. That this form of expression is good, but this form of expression is inherently bad and wrong. And if you think about the last hundred years, we've been playing catch up with the world ever since. I believe at that point we became the tail and not the head when it came to creativity. Think about how many Christian bands are, they sound just like so and so. How many times do you ever hear somebody say, oh, there's this great secular band. They sound just like this worship team that has made such an impact with their style that they've made a name for, a name for themselves. You never hear that, do we? Would you not agree with me that most art, whether it's worship music or painting or anything that's done to the glory of God in the body of Christ today is fairly passionless? It's usually not very well done and has very little effect. Now, I'm not here to, to be negative. What I want to do is say, why is this happening? What can we do to change it? I think everyone in here would agree with the statement that we are all called to change the world with our sound. Can everybody nod and say, yes, I agree with that. We are all called to change the world with the artistic output of our lives. Amen? Amen. And why aren't we? It doesn't seem to be happening to me. And maybe I'm the little kid that says the emperor has no clothes and everybody's like, shush, shush, shush. I'm the little guy in the back that's always saying, why is this? But nobody really wants to call on me, but I get to talk to you tonight. I get to say what I'm thinking. And I'm thinking that we've lost something. When, when we've lost basically two things, I feel like we've lost artistry and we've lost maturity. Now I'm going to hear like, how does this have to do with Tabernacle of David? Just let me tell you, okay? What we've lost is artistry and maturity and what I hope tonight to do is to start you on a path or engage you closer if you're already on the path. Towards submitted to the Holy Spirit, submitted to the authority that you are under, moving towards artistry in every area of your life and in maturation of that artistry. Any questions so far? Mostly deer in the headlight looks. That's okay, bear with me. Now, 
the action is when we're in the presence of God, right? Just then, and I would like to say right now, I felt his presence. I felt the goosebumps over the back of my neck. Not, and and it, was, it was real and it was tangible and it wasn't because somebody came up and hyped me into feeling that or some man-made um, show that was put on that gave me the good feelings. Nothing against those that are into hype or show because there's a lot of us in the body that do that as well. And God works through them in spite of that. But there was actual presence in here tonight. I still feel him in here. I'm going to take this off. Right? That's a beautiful thing. Now, if we're going to um, find his presence, we've got to look at where it came from. So in the Old Testament, you had basically three places where the habitation of the Lord resided. I promise I'm coming back to artistry and mature. So you had initially the tabernacle of Moses. Okay. And you had the tab of David. And then you had Solomon's temple. Everybody sort of see that? Mm -hmm. Can you read it from the back row? Is it too small? You have Good? a darker okay. pen. I will use a darker pen from here on out. Thank you. Tabernacle of Moses, Tabernacle of David, Solomon's temple. He rebuilt Solomon's temple a couple other times. We prophetically it's still the same thing. So there are three different places where his habitation was, where we created a place for that, right? What happened when Jesus came? When Jesus came, we became the habitation, right? Mm -hmm. Has anybody really thought much about these tabernacles before? Raise your hand if you've studied it, or you've read a book or two, you've thought about it a little bit before. Some of you have some vague familiarity. Okay, great. Now, some of you probably can teach this class better than me. The tabernacle of Moses was, was interesting because this was, it, it had to be um, portable because they were nomads at the time, so they would fold it up. And there was this whole ritual that the high priest would go through once a year to actually get into the, to the habitation where the Lord was. And so basically the high priest was doing his thing in order to, to atone for the sins of the people, right? So there was a lot of ritual and pattern and ceremony, right? And we're going to get into that for a minute. But the tabernacle of Moses had this whole process that it went through. But the tabernacle of David changed things. Because even though Moses' tabernacle was still functioning when David became king, one of the big revolutions that David said is, we're going to make a place of a habitation for the Lord and allow everybody equal access to the presence. Okay? So let me, let me unpack that for just a second, if you would. Artistry and maturity. So you have basically three parts to the tabernacle of Moses. You had the outer court. You had the inner court. And then you had the Holy of Holies. Now, is this... Please do me a favor. Be honest. If you've never heard of any of this, raise your hand. A couple honest people. Some of you, uh -uh. A couple of you have at least heard of this. Okay. I think when it relates to these two subjects, between audio teachings and books, I think I've studied about 40 or 50 of them by now, and nobody has talked about this in relationship to the artist in maturity before. If they have somebody, please send me the link to that book. Um, so the Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant was, and this is where his presence would reside. But in the Tabernacle of David, you had the Ark right here, the flaps are open, and the people are gathered around, all at basically equidistant from the presence. This is a revolution. Before, only the high priest could go in once a year. Now everybody gets to bask in the book. Now there's an important verse in Amos. You might have heard it quoted a lot. Amos 9.11, and it says, In that last day, I will restore the fallen tabernacle or tent of David. Amen. Okay? It's also recorded again in Acts only place in the Bible that it talks about this. Amos and requoted in Acts. Now Bible scholars will tell you and they're right that Jesus himself is the fulfillment of that scripture. For when Jesus came 
He became the sacrificial lamb that opened the door for us to bask in the glory of God directly for ourselves. That we didn't need the anointed king or the priest, that we could access the glory directly. Amen? It's a cool thing. Artistry. Maturity. But a lot of people are all excited about Tab of David because nowadays a lot of times we interpret that as a house of prayer, as a place of worship, as hosting his presence. Burn, I hop, what Bethany's doing down at Hop Hop, a place where we're hosting his presence and that be the only thing that we're really about in that place. Right? Anybody familiar with the prayer room? Only three people. Let me tell you about the No, anybody familiar with the prayer room? Seriously? Okay, how about birds? Okay. You know, we didn't have this 20 years ago, right? This is sort of a new thing. 20 years ago, it was church. 20 years ago, it was worship team on Sunday. And if you bought a building, maybe somebody could, could put some artwork on the walls, right? This whole idea of just hosting his presence is the only reason we would gather together for worship is sort of a modern idea, right? Isn't this kind of a new thing? Wouldn't you agree? No questions so far, that's all right. No comments, no suggestions, but there will be no M&Ms <laughs> if you don't jump in. Wait, you got M&Ms? <laughs> You're thinking ahead. Beautiful. <laughs> this is a fairly modern idea, though, that this idea that we would gather together solely to, to host the presence. Now, we had nights of worship back in the 80s, right? But not like what we're talking about now. We're going to have 24-7. How long has the Kansas City been going now? 14 years straight. Okay. But there's something different about this move that's unique. I th this is my own little theology, my own little idea. It might be wrong. But I got a feeling Jesus is coming back in the next 30, 40, 50 years. That's my thought. Now, I was a teenager when the booklet came out and said 88 reasons why Jesus is coming out in 88. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> and before, before the apostles died, they thought Jesus was coming back. And for 2,000 years of church history, we've always thought he was coming back. Now. So it might be a thousand years from now that we're, we're all wrong and he's still tearing it. And that's awesome. I kind of think it's going to be in the next 30, 40, 50 years. And here's, what I, here's why. Because I think that, that when Israel became a state again in 1948, I think that kicked off a timer in the spirit. That's a big deal. That hadn't happened since 70. Right? And that fulfills all kinds of prophecy. You guys probably could teach on that as well. Right? And then a lot of people could say that in certain passages of scripture when he says a day, it really means 100 years. And that last day, maybe this last day is 100 years, 1948, maybe 2048, somewhere around there, maybe he'll come back. I know it's a very loose thing I'm painting here, because I'm not even trying to bring about a theology of Jesus coming back. I'm trying to paint another picture, okay? But if this is really the last days, it kind of makes sense to me, because I'm of the opinion that this area of artistry where we've become the tail instead of the head has to be reversed and brought into maturity Amen. before his bride is ready for his return. That's good. Okay, that's my opinion. So how do we do that? And I would ask all of you music makers and others who are not music makers who have their own expressions in this room, if we were called to change the world with our sound, why isn't that happening? <clears throat> Is it happening? And somebody, is it happening and I'm missing it? Can somebody please raise their hand and say, no, it's happening here. Let me tell you about it. It basically isn't. Right? This should arrest all of us on some level of, oh my gosh. Some of us have been doing music and worship for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. I, I would even uh, submit to you that as worship people, musicians, we've barely moved the needle of the church. Let alone change the world. And forgive me, pastor, and all pastors, but I'm of the opinion that the people singing the songs and the people making the sounds have more potential of steering the rudder of this ship of the body than the pastors, yeah. than the apostles. Music's got more legs. People remember worship songs more than sermons. That alone right there should, in a very simplistic way, say, hey, wait a second. Maybe our role is not just to make people happy on Sunday morning. Maybe our role is not just to, to do excellently or ho even maybe our role is more than just to host his presence. Maybe our role as, as Levites and priests to get alone with the Lord and find out what his voice sounds like. Hear what his voice is saying. Church, I want you to go in this direction or that direction. Write songs and create sounds that would influence us towards that and now walk in. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Maybe our responsibility is more than just making people feel good on Sundays so that they'll put more in the offering plate. I think 
it is. And if I didn't think it was, I'd have gone on the road with any of the secular guys that offered me gigs because it would have been way more fun, honestly. Way more fun. No offense. Artistry. Maturity. So everybody's talking about the tabernacle of David. This is a thing that's happening right now on the planet. You know, harp and bowl is something that I have people talk about a lot. Revelation 5.8. Talk about the harp which represents worship and, and to those people and the bowl has the prayers of the saints in it, right? Worship and prayer, worship and prayer together. Ray Hughes and another scholar friend of mine have both confirmed to me that historically there have been a lot of other prayer movements on the planet. But there's never before been one that has had worship as such a high component with the prayer, ever. This is the first time we've seen this on the planet. And the prayer room movement, the burn movement 24-7, what you got? Can you speak up? It's dumb. But... <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Everybody repeat after me. The only stupid question, question is the pancake place. Is the one we don't ask. Yeah. You keep saying IHOP and all I keep thinking about is pancakes. What it's is a pancake IHOP? place. That's okay. <laughs> IHOP is a place called International House of Prayer. Oh, okay. And it was founded in Kansas City in 1999. They started doing 24 hours a day, 7 days a week worship and prayer nonstop. And they haven't stopped since. They've been going for 14 years. And they have thus inspired or spawned maybe even thousands at this point. Definitely hundreds of worship and prayer rooms all over the world. There's three in Jerusalem. There's how many are in the Austin area off the top of your head? Three. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. And, and not that IHOP in Kansas City is the only one, but they've been a huge influence on it. Okay? Yes, ma'am? Would you count as music saving lives as music changing the world? Music saving lives. I do. I, not that, you bring up a great point. It's actually in my notes. So let me share something that kind of gets to it. If you feel like I don't answer your question, raise your hand again in a minute, okay? Okay. Because when she says music saving lives changing the world, I would venture that every one of you who has an evangelistic muscle says, wait a second, we just need to get people saved. And that'll get people to change. That'll change the world. And the teachers in the room would say, we just need sound doctrine. We need people to really pay attention to the, the guy in the hat that's flapping his lips with, on hydrocodone because great teaching is what's going to change the world. Okay? And the pastors and everybody who has their particular mindset the way God gifted us, but we're music people. We're arts people. And I do believe that there are times when an anointed sound can, on its own, heal people and deliver them from from addictions and strongholds and save them by the power of the Holy Spirit. We, in Florida, the school, we had this, this uh, bright white piano that was donated to us. And the first thing I saw with this piano, I thought, this is a canvas. So we, we did a whole week where we painted prophetically the whole piano. Had this lady come in from um, the Seattle School of Prophetic Arts. And we prayed over that piano. And my prayer was, Lord, I'd like people to walk in and see this thing. And from the power of the anointing that's on it, for them to instantly be healed of physical ailments. I believe it's absolutely possible. That does change. But I'm, I'm heading towards something else with this change the world. It's a, it's a brilliant question. Because absolutely getting people saved will change their lives. But getting people saved is only the first step. Okay? And, and here's where... Oh, Lord help me. Here's where the vision that I've been pursuing for 20 years comes into play. So this all kind of comes into this little vision I've been looking at. And the vision is a generation of people that have a foundation of wholeness and health mm. in their soul. Now if you'll forgive me, Pastor, and again, please feel free to correct me later. But I'm of the opinion that most Christians are really kind of, in a sense, not saved. In a sense. Because Paul talks about working out our salvation. And I believe that talks about us getting healed from our stuff. And just because our spirit man comes alive when we get saved doesn't mean that we still don't have junk on us or incorrect responses built into our psyche or strongholds from the junk that, that put us in the past. And that working out, that getting healed is, is not really in the best interest of most churches. Because the more we walk in heal wholeness and health, the less we need the anointed ones, the leaders. Because we can access the glory of God directly. Right? The best worship leaders are the ones that teach people how to worship for themselves so they work themselves out of a job. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. But most congregations are immature spiritually. Most congregations, worship-wise, need to be 
led to the river and open their mouth and, and pull their tongue out and put some water on it and then push it back in and help them swallow and say, how does that taste? That's an immature body, right? People ought to get grown up. Artistry, maturity. So this vision was about people walking in health and wholeness, getting rid of their junk and their stuff. And then it had three pillars on it, this vision of this generation of artists who were warriors, who were prophetic, who were drawing on this, this wholeness in their soul, that were drawing on the prophetic voice of the Lord, but were free in their artistic creativity and had a, an urge and a desire, a burning desire to never stop working their craft. Never stop building more pots in their technique for the Holy Spirit to pour oil in through. Now, we've never seen this on the planet. And also kind of an answer to your question. What was your name? Tina. Tina, and also to answer your question a little bit, the people that I think have changed the world with their sound in the last 100 years are, some examples, Jimi Hendrix, The Beatles, Miles Davis. None of these people are saved. All of these people were dysfunctional, screwed up, wounded, junkies. You could even make a case that they were anointed, but they weren't honoring the Father. Could you imagine an entire generation of people who are whole in their soul, who've gotten the religion and society's issues as it relates to artists dealt with, and those walls broken off of them, completely sold out, submitted to the Holy Spirit, no wrinkle in their walk with the Lord, creating, and now you can see a new sound that I've been hearing prophesied for 25 years. You guys have heard about the new sound, right? You guys walk in spirit-filled circles. At some point, somebody, especially if you're a musician, somebody, somebody who's looking for a bigger offering is going to come over and prophesy over you. The new sound is coming. Because it is. But every time that I see that spoken about, I see then the response. That sounds great. And everybody sits back and waiting. And I'm telling you, I think I've got an idea on how to get there. I think I've got a little revelation on how to get there. Good. And it's here. And it's partly related to artistry. And maturity. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Temple of Solomon tonight, partly because there's so much you can grasp from the Temple of Solomon, but the Tab of Moses prophetically and symbolically represents the church in the Old Testament. And the Tab of David represents prophetically and symbolically where we are now post Jesus. Okay, so a lot of the symbolic and prophetic things that are that are that are garnered here is for this season on the planet, post Jesus pre-return, this is where we are now. But I would submit to you that everybody that's, that's so overdosing on Tab of David kind of makes the Tab of Moses and just kind of forgets it. And that's what I wanted to bring to you. You said there was a clock, but I don't see what, 826, okay, we're good. Oh. Thank you for bearing with me. I believe that when, when Jesus came, he didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law, right? So Bible-believing churches embrace the Old Testament and the New. There's all kinds of stuff that we glean from both. Yeah. Right? I think it's a, it's a strategic mistake to so totally focus on the tabernacle of David at the expense of what God can show us here. So I want to unpack a little bit because I feel like when this tab of Moses mm -hmm. is, is embraced in its fullness and this revelation becomes part of your life, I think it puts the tab of David in a whole other light. So if you'll, if, you'll, uh, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to make a bigger tab of Moses to illustrate this. When you start walking in the artistry and the maturity, I'm not saying that you aren't now, but when you start walking in the fullness of your artistry and your maturity as submitted to the Holy Spirit, you're going to see this tabernacle of David as the coolest canvas you've ever seen. Because it's the opening. It is... An ability to create and to make mistakes in your artistic path that Sunday morning just won't allow. <coughs> this is the outer court. This is the inner court, the Holy of Holies. When people look at this, they look at Jesus. Oh, if you want to do it, if you want to take a fascinating study, and there's several books on this, of just how Jesus is revealed. In the tabernacle of Moses, it'll blow your mind. It's the most beautiful thing. There was so much that was predestined for Jesus to walk into that you see in this. But for right now, I'm, I want to look at it from the standpoint of the artist. You can also, um, there's, 
two different schisms in the body of Christ. One says that we are two-part being. Others say we are three-part being. I'm of the three-part being. So if you'll indulge me, if you're a two-parter, see me after class and we'll debate it. I believe that we're three-part beings. That we are a spirit. Mm -hmm. That we have a soul and an inner man and we live inside this body. Mm -hmm. You've heard that before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes, ma'am? No. Oh, you're just saying yes. Okay. <laughs> so I believe you can look at the tabernacle moments as representing... That part of us. Outer court represents our flesh. Mm, that's interesting. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the courts we start in after we go through the outer gate. One of the things we do in the outer court is clap hands. Right? It's flesh striking flesh, trying to get rid of it as we head towards the Holy of Holies. To purify ourselves in just the way that the priests had to purify themselves on the way in. Striking the ground. It's exuberant. It's halal. It's woohoo! Right? It also has two pieces of furniture in it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go quickly through it because I just want to give you the symbology and, and depth comes into another thing because there's, like I said, 40 hours worth of classes. But there's this brazen altar here. And then there's this, this basin of water, the labor. Now, this brazen altar is where they would slaughter the animals as part of the ceremony. This represents our sin that has to get dealt with at this point. Now, I could go for days on this, but I want to bring up one that nobody likes to talk about and probably you won't hear very often. If you're an artist person, if you're a person who's engaged in creativity, you have had a target painted on your back by Satan in your sexual identity from birth. I would wager that every one of you has been sexually abused, you've walked in homosexuality, you've had pornography addiction, maybe you even do now. Because sexual dysfunction is a plan of the enemy to keep the creative class down and screwed up and messed up. Why is that? I just realized there are people underage in here. Oh my gosh. Okay, Lord, close your ears. Jesus. Here's the deal. When you go to create something as an artist, which each of you are, when you go to create a sound, a song, a word, a teaching, a horribly scrawled image on a dry erase bar. When you go to create anything, mm -hmm. it's a, that part of you is your will that makes the decision, right? And this part of you is intrinsically tied to your sexual being. Because your sexual being was designed for procreation. So when you go to have the ability to create a new person, it's prophetically, symbolically, spiritually, it's the same part of you. That's creating a new song. That's creating a new piece of art. That's creating a new dance form. Okay? It's the same thing. When you engage in art, when you engage in making music, when the band is really grooving, or you find that perfect shade of blue that, that hits whatever you're thinking of, when you have those moments of yay, what's happening in you is you get a hit physiologically in your brain. You smile. Or you may not smile, but you smile inwardly. Okay? That same physiological thing that's happening when you when you find the moment and the groove is just right or you find just the right lick or whatever it is it's the same thing as when a, a man and wife are being intimate and they hit that moment it's the same thing physiologically okay so at the brazen altar though there's lots of ways we can go I do want to bring up the idea that if you're going to fulfill this artistry and maturity thing I'm, I'm bringing to you tonight I want you to Ask yourself, Lord, or ask the Lord, Lord, is there an area of sexual dysfunction in my life or even just in my mind that's left over from the junk that's been handed to me? Have you gotten completely whole and healed from the abuse that you suffered as a child? Have you gotten rid of the stronghold that this, this discipling culture has put on us of what sex is and isn't? I would venture to say most of us would have to say no in fullness. I urge you to take a look at that, and I'm just wanting to hit some highlights. So I'm going to move on. I'm going to even just skip the labor because of time, but the labor is a, it's a water basin. You basically, you'd, you'd uh, sacrifice animals for your sins at the, the brazen altar, and then at the labor, you, as a priest, you would wash from the water, and it was made of copper, so you, and it was shined brightly so you could see yourself in it. It represents the Word of God, represents a whole lot of stuff. It's a revealer of who you are as well as a washer. But then you go into this inner court, it's also called the holy place as um, the holy place or inner court. It's the holy place. 
The inner court represents your soul. This is your inner man. And there's three pieces of furniture in here. There is a lampstand. You guys seen the candelabra, right? Not the candelabra, the uh, menorah, mm -hmm. right? Came right here. Menorah is a, it's a, in Jewish households when you see the little seven, seven or eight candle thing on Christmas time, because it, it, it came from here. It's this little lampstand. This was, this was all open to the sun, the outer court, but the inner court is covered over with um, animal hides and, and so forth. And so the only light is coming from this lampstand. There's this table here with a bunch of bread, 12 loaves specifically. So this is a table of bread. And then there's an altar of incense here that's here burning smoke. Okay, so this guy's got light coming out. This guy's got smoke coming out. And the, the bread usually doesn't smell good because it's kind of moldy. <laughs> so part of the priests deal with this is they had to go in on a daily, sometimes weekly basis to change out the oil. They had to eat the bread and put more bread in. They had to re restock the incense guy and the smoke. So you would walk in here and there's this kind of dim light from the candles over on the side. And then there's this smoke that's just filling the chamber from the altar of incense. Okay. If this represents our inner man, our soul, I would urge you to consider that the lampstand represents your intellect, your mind. The altar of incense represents your emotion and your passion. And the table of showbread represents your will, because inside your inner man are three parts, your mind, your will, and your emotions. With me so far? Yeah? Getting too technical? No? Trust me, this is all going to come back to artistry. <laughs> And maturity. Oh, I need some water. The showbread represented your will. No stupid question. Now I would I would venture to say that as it relates to the artist, of which we all are, we're gonna get there in just a second. The lampstand, your mentality, your intellect represents your technique. This represents things like scales and salsa rhythms and color theory and understanding the difference between Cicchetti Ballet and whatever that other ballet form is. Do you remember what they did? Yeah. Cicchetti is the Italian one and then there's like four other ballet things. Technique. Whatever it is that's your craft, your, um, your outward expression. Now this is tough for most of us to swallow because you guys are artist people, right? You're expressive people. And you're used to, when you do your expression, when you do your art, you're used to getting those little mental hits, right? But working your technique gives you no hits. Anybody enjoy practicing scales when they're taking piano lessons back in the day? You're the lone exception because, and, and, and I, though I love that about you, I would also say that practicing scales, practicing your technique is its own form of worship. In fact, it's a very divinely sacred thing. But I would say, Rachel was your name? I would say that you're probably overqualified for 90% of the worship teams in America. Probably any church in America would love for you to come in because they're always looking for good keyboard players. And though that's awesome for you, that's kind of sad about the state of American church. Because what we should be after is a much higher bar. Not that you're bad at all, because you're really good. But we're after these greater things, okay? And working your technique is part of that. This is a lifelong thing. If you're truly going to submit yourself to get into the Holy of Holies, you're going to have to submit your, sometimes your TV watching, or your Call of Duty playing, or your Facebooking, because maybe what you're called to do is spend some time getting your craft together, getting your technique together, and not settling for what your worship team demands of you skill-wise. But looking at the people that have change the world with their sound and comparing your technique with them probably finding yourself wanting and going oh my gosh I got some catch up to do as I've been doing for 30 years you know what I mean if you're going to submit you've got to submit your craft fully this altar of incense represents your passion and your emotion now this has changed a little bit in recent years but I would say up until five or ten years ago, it was kind of hard to find any passion in worship. In fact, it was kind of hard to find any passion in Christian music at all. But we listened to it because we were supposed to, and we listened to it because it was taboo to listen to anything secular, right? And because it was more godly. And for some people, this became their whole culture. 
this incestuous subculture that we call Christian music. This became how they operated. So how, we, how we looked at the world it was through the eyes of what the Nashville music industry decided was appropriate that particular year. Right? What this has created is an American Idol type of generation that says that music is designed to be judged, which is wrong. Music's not designed to be judged, unless you're learning, in which case you want to judge, find yourself wanting and get back to the practice room, get back to writing a better song. Okay? How many times Rachel, I'm sorry, where's David, was it David Cook? Cloud, David Cloud. How many times, uh, you, you're the worship pastor here, right? Yeah. Is there, how often is there a Sunday that goes by where nobody says anything to you after church? Three. Do most of the time though people at some point when they see you in the hall, they say, oh, brother, worship was great Sunday. Yeah, every now and then. Yeah, most of the time. Really? Because no matter what you do, if you're horrible, people are gonna feel the goosebumps. If you're awesome, you'll get a longer line. You know what I mean? But the bar says, if I felt the presence of God, you're doing a good job and you're accepted. And that's all you need to do. Okay? And in most cases, you don't have to put your heart and your passion into it. And you don't have to put any technique into it as compared to the world. But when art has become bland and passionless, it has no more ability to change things. I said the word incestuous earlier and I got some eyebrows go up. Because one of the problems is, is that if all we only do is listen to only the, the acceptable worship leaders that we all listen to, what happens then is when we go to create something, we're drawing on the DNA that we've been brought, that we've exposed ourselves to. And if we're only drawing from the same pool genetically, then what we end up creating with each successive generation has less and less power and less and less ability to change. Okay? What's the definition of insanity, somebody? Are we all insane? <laughs> Are we all in the body of Christ insane? Are we all worship leaders, musicians, songwriters, artists? Are we insane? We're called to change the world with what we do. We barely move the needle of the church. And I think at least the keys that I'm into, I'm not saying it's the only ones, but a big part of the keys is artistry and maturity. And when I can take the pain that I was feeling yesterday afternoon where I'm writhing on the floor in the doctor's office waiting for my wife to get back and they're pinning me down trying to pump more things up in my mouth to deaden the pain and I'm just bawling, just ah! That was me yesterday for the last 30 hours when I wasn't on drugs. Okay? Where is that passion when I worship? Where is that level of of emotion when I present my offering to the Lord. It's not there yet. I'm working on it. Anybody ever been to a church where you just can't believe the worship leader? It feels like they're just phoning it in. It feels like they've, they've, they've got a little formula and they're going down their checklist. Right? That's not great art. And we're missing something here at this passion. But the action Jackson, Jackson part of this is this table of bread. Because this table of bread represents your will. It represents your ability to say, yes, Lord, or no, Lord, I don't want you. It represents your decision-making ability. Right? This is your artistry. This is your creativity. This is your expressive voice. And it's why if I get up there and play piano, it's going to sound different than Rachel. Because i got my style and she's got hers. We can both be drawing from the same spirit. But you put two prophets in a room, and each prophet hears exactly the same thing, it's going to come out different. Because they've each got their own artistic expression, their own culture, their own background, their own language. I've had people go and reteach my classes before, but nobody, nobody teaches it like me. Because I'm me. I don't want them to teach it like me. They need to teach it like themselves. Right? It's a poor father who preconceives an idea of where their son's going to end up when they grow up. It's a poor father, and if you are one of these fathers, feel free to see me after class, who is a doctor and says, I want my son to go to medical school and join me in my practice. It's not a bad idea, but if you force your kid into it, it's not good fathering. Right? Mm -hmm. And yet I would venture to say, and I'm sure Pastor John is excluded from this, most pastors in America have a preconceived idea of what they want their children, worship leader, artistry people to come out. They have, they have a preconceived idea of what they want out of them, what they need out of them. 
but aren't supposed to change things. And if we keep doing the same thing over and over and we, you know, change, are we insane? But maybe if we completely submit our will to the Holy Spirit, if we completely submit our artistry and creativity and expression to the Holy Spirit, you ever heard that phrase, I want to be a slave to Christ? And we know that that means it's the greatest amount of freedom that we can walk in as human beings. Imagine being so submitted to your will, your artistry, being so submitted to the Holy Spirit. I believe it'll create the most creative, artistic, expressive that a human being can be. And Jimi Hendrix could not touch that. And the Beatles could not touch that because they were not drawn from this. But we have that capability. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created. And then later he says he created us in his image. Are we not creators? And isn't the whole purpose of that for us to go into the throne room and create something of ourselves to give back to the Lord? Isn't that one definition of worship? Absolutely. Worship's a conversation. Nobody brought their hands up on that because they figured I'd just go right into it, but I paused long enough just to see. Worship's a conversation. Yes. You know when you pray and you intercede and you travail? It's talking to the Lord. Right? When the prophetic comes in, he's talking down to us, through us, speaking to us. But worship is the combination of the two. Worship is a conversation between us and God. And yes, we are to be holy and reverent and bow down and worship. But we're also expected to converse with him. That means we've got to bring something to the table. To bring something of our own. When my son was five, I gave him a dollar. I said, go put it in the offering plate because I wanted him to learn how to give. We've all done that or seen that, right? But when he's grown, I expect him to make his own money. And tithe his own dollar, right? But forgive me, most of the church, myself included, is still stuck on taking something that Chris Tomlin created for the Lord and offering it as our own. When each of us were created to yes. create, when each of us have a sound and a song within us, when this church, what's the name of this church? I'm so sorry. New Hope. New Hope. New Hope is called and purposed of God to have its own sound and its own songs. Hop yeah. Hop is designed and purposed by God to have its own sound and its own songs. Each of you here is designed to have your own sound. Yeah. And what you start off doing is copying. Because that's how you start. You copy Stevie Ray Vaughan licks, or you copy a Chris Tomlin song, or you copy. But where we settled is stopping there. Because that makes us, gives, gives us a little hit, and it makes people think that we're good musicians and good worship leaders, when there's so much more. After imitating, you then assimilate all these influences. Then you innovate something new out of it. That's the plan of God. That's why we're here on the planet. That's why he's given us the tools that he's given us. Copy paste is for the tech junkies. Okay? But at some point, you've got to make your own line. At some point, you've got to draw your own thing. This church that I'm in right now, New Hope, I've been in a, probably thousands of churches. This is very similar to a lot of other churches I've been into. It's also radically different. It looks nothing like a lot of other churches that I've been in. Somebody somewhere decided, we like this color carpet. We're going to get this maroon chair. We're not going to do pews. That might have been a theological reason or a cultural reason, but we're going to, might have been we want to be more flexible, whatever. We're going to do these chairs. We're going to hand out. Somebody decided to put the sound booth there. Somebody decided to put the drums in that back corner instead of that corner in the middle. All of those are creative decisions. Worship leaders, you don't have to have a keyboard or two and a guitar or two and bass and drums. That's not the only palette for making music. That's just the one that the American church thinks is normal. When is a trombone kazoo worship band going to blow my mind with anointed God? Where are the reggae worship teams? Where are the salsa worship teams? Where are the worship teams that are coming up with brand new styles and brand new sounds and the world is going, who in the world is that? Okay? Because that's what we've been called to do is to change the world with our sound and it's going to take coming with a new sound to do it. Now, at the same time, we've got to stay submitted. We say submitted. I, I led worship um, at True Life the other day. Some of you guys were there. I did some songs people know. I did some copy songs. Absolutely. Because discipleship is meeting people where they are. And the body's not ready for you to come out there and improvise a whole worship setting. Unless you're one of the, the, the fancy people. The fancy people, I, I, I'll catch you, Tina. The fancy people are Chris Tomlin and Israel Houghton and Jesus Culture and insert whatever name of worship person that you have. Right? Because they're the ones that are writing songs that people want to copy. 
But I submit to you that every person in this room has within them not only the ability, but the calling of God on your life to come up with your own song, your own new rhythms, your own new sound. It's not just for the special ones. We're the special ones. We are artists. We are artists. Say it. I am an artist. I, am an artist. I, was, created I was created to create. And if, you, if I could convince you right now that you, not just this generic you, but you, Joel, and you, Denmark, and you guys that I don't know your names, that you individually, personally, <coughs> were called of God and being gifted of God to change the world with your creativity, to change the world with your expression. It sounds like a big thing. It sounds like it's only for the special people. It's not. If I told you it was for you, how would that change what you do tomorrow? How would that change what you do next week? How would that change what you do Sunday morning? How would that change your calendar? How would that change your bank account? How would that change your patterns of habit? I tell you, you were called to change the world with your sound. Submit it to the Holy Spirit. And allow something new to come to the table. This uniquely you, your conversation with the Lord, you and the Holy Spirit co-creating something that will fulfill this, this grand purpose of God. Let me tell you something. It's been amazing to watch. I, I grew up in the, in the early 80s. In the very beginning of that, they, didn't know, they really didn't know worship. They'd kind of get around and do some courses. But the worship movement kind of kicked off. Being, your, your mileage may vary, but late 80s and 90s, all of a sudden it was worship music, worship music. And then you had the CCM artists and the Michael W. Smiths and all of them kind of doing inter Christian entertainment kind of stuff. And then, and then somewhere in the late 90s and about 10, 15 years ago, it all started converging because people started getting, man, worship music's pretty cool. Michael W. Smith puts out a worship album. And I'm not saying he's a trend jumper. I'm just saying you could see things starting to coalesce, people understanding that, oh, music is less about entertaining. Entertaining means to detain from entering. Maybe there's something deeper that I can go after here. So, so people at, at, at subconscious started getting into worship music, right? And now it's really popular and there's a whole industry Right? The downside is, is any music critic of any newspaper or blog or website will listen to Christian music and they'll put their finger in their mouth trying to gag. They've listened to worship music which has very little artistic integrity. And because they don't know the spirit, they won't sense the spirit. When we worshiped earlier tonight with Mr. Cloud's leadership, we felt the presence, did we not? We felt, it wasn't just the goosebumps, but it was our, our spirit communed with the yeah. Lord. It was beautiful. Right? Now this is where you can correct me later if you need to. But if all your worship does is feed your spirit, you will eventually burn out. Because worship is designed to be tri-dimensional. God's heart for worship is that it feeds my flesh and it intrigues my intellect and it stirs my passions and emotions like a good movie does. When was the last time you left Sunday morning and felt completely as fulfilled as you did when you left the Avengers? <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Hollywood's figured out how to hit all of them. There's, there's people that'll, that'll take every single movie and they'll look at all the prophetic, symbolic things that are in it and they'll glean all this stuff and the Lord will use it. And I, I totally am down with all of that. I could probably write a paper on The Matrix, you know? But, yeah, you know what I'm saying? But couldn't worship music do the same thing? Couldn't wor wouldn't worship music, worship art, have the capability of stirring us in that same way, of changing us and shaping us? Mm -hmm. What kind of mindset did the Avengers plant in the entire planet from that movie? What kinds of attitudes were implanted? We live in a culture that disciples us, mm. sadly. Right? Mm -hmm. But we are called to be the disciples. We are called to be the disciples. Now, I'm not saying you need to go back to your home church and say, Pastor, this awesome guy was saying that you, I got to do all this stuff and I got to get outside of my box and you put me in this. Thing. No. Because maturity brings submission. Maturity understands. The mature artist says, okay, this particular setting, this is going to be the thing that works the best. This is going to be the thing that maybe will widen the envelope just a little bit. The mature artist understands who they are. They walk through a process of identity with the Lord and with their artistry. Miles? No, you're not Miles. What's your name, sir? Gary. I think of Miles every time. But Gary, you, you, you do, I've only seen you do percussion and djembe, right? 
Yeah, I, I shaky things. Shaky things. <laughs> shaky, 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 shaky. You play shaky. piano? No. Did you ever try to play piano? Uh, no. Did you ever want to play piano? <laughs> but, yeah. not, but not strong enough, not passionate no, no, enough to go through it all, right? No. Partly because your preference is an indicator of your artistry. And your preference was shaky things and maybe guitar, maybe other things. So it's okay that you don't play piano, but you've got to figure out who you are and where your influences come from. This is not about humanism. This is about, through the Spirit, finding out who we are Amen. and bringing that to the fore, our own unique identity and expression as worshipers. Yeah? When this starts happening in fullness, when you've actually gone back with counseling, with deliverance teams, with pastoral help, or just with you and the Holy Spirit in a cave, and gotten your junk dealt with, and your holes filled up, you start dealing with some of these sin issues. You start walking with the Lord to the, to the degree that you hear His voice moment by moment, and His word is burned into your heart. You start submitting your mind and your technique and craft at this lampstand. I'm going to get, did you get on a pattern of habit that from now until the end of your life, you're going to continue to study the craft of painting, the craft of pencil drawing, the craft of salsa piano playing, whatever it is. If you start walking out that, that fullness, then some of the passions that are released inside of you are going to get put into worship. And I, I hope Jeremy comes and teaches if he doesn't. Jeremy Burke is this guy I've been playing with. What I love about Jeremy as a worship leader, he opens his mouth and sings one word and you hear all of the passion. Rita Springer's like that. You hear the pain. Yeah. You know? Can you feel that pain that's in Rita's voice? We, there ought to be some sort of feeling of emotion with everybody because of that passion. And by the way, if this is where the, if the Holy of Holies is where the um, Ark of the Covenant sits, and that's really where the presence of God. If you go and look in the scriptures, you're going to see in one place it places the altar of incense here in the inner court. In another place in the scriptures it says it's here in the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant. <gasps> Bible disagreed with itself. What's it mean? My personal interpretation is that the altar of incense is sitting there bubbling smoke the whole time. And there's just this big thick curtain that's permeable in between. Because I'm not actually sure which, which place the actual altar of incense was because the incense suffused both chambers equally. Well, in the New, New Testament it was torn in two. Thank you. And the New Testament was torn in two, which is another, which even, even more um, reinforces my point that sometimes your, your spirituality and your emotions are hard to discern. Sometimes they feel like the same thing. Maturity helps us with that. Right? Maturity says, oh, I'm feeling this way, but this is actually what God's doing. It might be two different things. But if you can imagine a whole generation of people holding their soul, completely submitted, sold out to God in their craft, their technique, that they are walking in artistry and creativity. Every single one of you in this room can do this in your own way, in your own life. Now I can see some things changing. And then I see the prayer room showing up, the tabernacle of David. And I see the prayer room as this empty canvas. Because in the prayer room you can do things, you can paint things, you can sing things that don't really work on Sunday mornings. Because Sunday mornings you have other things that you need to do. Whether you're a painter or a bass player, it doesn't matter. There's certain things that have to happen on Sunday mornings in most churches. Except this one really cool church in Cincinnati that I was at where they actually do harp and bowl on Sunday mornings and that's it. They don't preach, they don't teach, they do Sunday school, they do other things. It's just presence on Sunday mornings and that's it. But that's the one exception of hundreds of churches I've been around. Because Sunday morning you gotta do stuff. Sunday morning you gotta you gotta pass the plate because we gotta pay for the light bulb. We gotta, you know, keep this full machine running, right? And that's understandable and it's cool. But if you've got an artist in you and you've got stuff in you that doesn't fit on Sunday morning, go hang out at the prayer room. They're probably going to make a place for you. What also is cool at the prayer room is in artistry, you try stuff that doesn't work. And then you go, oh, okay. So you might, you might try 12 things before you find the one thing that's good. I, I, I used to produce records a lot. And a lot of people would come into my office and they, you know, they'd say, well, my main strength is a songwriter. So, oh, really? How many songs have you written? Well, like 12 and I'm almost finished with a 13. No, you're not a songwriter. I, you might write songs, but songwriters have written hundreds of songs. I was talking with Dennis Jernick the other day. He's written tens of thousands of songs. And in those thousands or hundreds of songs, there's a few gems, right? 
But the artist needs a place to throw stuff up against the wall and see what sticks and what doesn't. They need a place to have mistakes. They need a place of grace. And most churches aren't down with grace on Sunday morning. Pastors, I'm sure, is excluded. Because you've got to make things happen. Right? It's rare to see a difference in that. But the prayer room? I don't usually see prayer room facilitators saying, now, make sure you're done in 20 minutes and make sure that the... I did a prayer room set before I left Florida for two hours. I, have, I use all these weird instruments on sound. And, the, and I did all wordless vocals. I never did a word lyric at all, even though I have my Bible. And to the best of my recollection, I don't think I ever gave tone to anything. Because I was scraping my strings and doing weird sound effects on the keyboard and all, all kinds of oddball sounds and weird, crazy things that didn't even have, didn't even have necessarily musicality to it because you couldn't hear like chords and melodies. And I'm a music major. I'm into music. But this was a, an expression. This was what I was feeling at the time. And there were three people in the prayer room and two of them came up to me afterwards and said, and they were kind of ignoring, it looked to me like they were ignoring what I was doing, which was great because I didn't want to feel like I had to leave them anywhere. I was just... I was just finding the presence of God through this particular avenue. And two of them came up afterwards and said, I got this, the, the Lord gave me this whole movie and what you were doing was the score behind the movie and the sound effects and it was like the slam and then the thing and they had all these prophetic dreams and I was just like, this is great, totally cool. You can never do it on Sunday morning. <laughs> You'd have deer in the headlights from absolutely everybody including the pastor. But you can try stuff out. All of a sudden the tabernacle of David becomes a canvas where you can try out this artistry thing. This maturity thing. It's not to say you can't take Sunday mornings for, further forward as well, because I do believe there's going to be a crossover with that. Nor am I advocating everybody ditch their worship teams and churches. That's why I need to take my hyper code on. And it's not a problem. But the Tabernacle of David, one thing I don't hear anybody talking about is it's a canvas. And it's a canvas for such a time as this on the planet. Even the Moravians did a hundred years solid of prayer and worship in Germany. But they only sang a few songs here and there. There wasn't a lot of worship component. Yes, ma'am. I'll take the pill. <laughs> Where's my little bag? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take a hydrocodone so in 30 minutes I'm not writhing on the floor. And honestly, that's kind of what I came here to share with you guys. Um, every area that we've talked about, I have just classes upon classes about, because um, I've been working on this for 20-some years. But um, I, I want to thank Greg, who barely knows me, giving me this... This, his, his platform. I mean, that's pretty crazy. You know? Because I might be, like, off. And he might be, go back and correct his, my theology next week. <laughs> that's great, and I hope he does. But seriously, that's pretty, it's been pretty amazing. We just moved here from Florida about three or four months ago, and the city of Austin has so embraced us when I've been in town because I've been traveling a lot. And, um, it's been pretty amazing because a lot of what we're bringing is kind of some new ideas, and not everybody's that open to new ideas. So, um, I, I ask you to say with me one more time. I am an artist. I am an artist. I was created to create. I was created to create. And I am called, I am called, called to bring something of myself to worship. Bring something of myself to worship. Lord, I ask you right now that you would take whatever I've said tonight that is not of you and is not your will. I ask that you curse it at the root and let it have no effect. Lord, I ask that the things that are of you, that those seeds would take deep root and would be watered and discipled after tonight. We might see the fruit of what you showed me so many years ago. Lord, I call forth the new sound, the new painting, the new dance steps, the new, that's, while it's still submitted to your Holy Spirit, I call that forth in the people that are here tonight. And Lord, I thank you for allowing me to fulfill my dreams by being in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You need the microphone. Yeah, I, I talk louder than you do. I, I think this is just so important where we submit those areas of our lives as we enter into the Holy of Holies. And, and it's really key. And these next three weeks, um, we're going to do some crazy things. I, next week, I'm going to teach you on a new song, how to release a new song. And we're actually going to do it. I'm probably going to move a bunch of these chairs out of the way. I'm going to make you come up here and shove a microphone in your mouth. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that actually happened to me. Um, Ray Hughes' daughter, I was at a conference and she was teaching on it. And it really set me free because I thought everything had to rhyme. And God would give me one word or two words. I'm like, I need the whole phrase. I need the whole song. 
And he's like, no, step back. I'm like, no. <laughs> I, I need a whole phrase. And, and uh, she really broke that off of me. And, and I'm going to share that next week. The, uh, Adam Wilson's going to be here to lead worship next week. Uh, then the following week, we're going to teach, uh, Rocky Ivy's going to teach on movement. And I'm, I know we've got some dancers in here. And the enemy has tried to steal everything from the church. All the creative things, you know, they say, oh, you can't dance in the church. You can't, I mean, when I was growing up, you couldn't use drums. Claim to be Christian. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was like, you couldn't dance, you couldn't. <laughs> I was Baptist. Oh, no. what, what can I say? I, but I love my roots. I love what I grew up in because of what they taught. I just returned from Haiti. And in Haiti, uh, we learned that, like the banners and everything, every different color banner represents a different spirit in Buddhism. So they won't use it in the church. They can't use a djembe in the church because it's considered part of their, it's part of their culture that's tied in that's tied in with it. So much so that they can't even put a cross up in their church because voodoo uses a cross. I mean, the enemy tries to steal yeah. everything. You know, and, and it's our job as creative people to take that back, you know, and redeem it and give it back to God. Can I just tag on to that? Yeah. Okay, just listen to this real quick. And listen with your spirit more than your ears. anything that I did, but I'm anointed and called to God. So there's a there's this was originally created to, to be in Buddhist temples. And by my theology it's used to call forth the demonic. Right? You can't use that in church. Absolutely you can. God created sound. And if I'm walking the way I'm supposed to walk, there's a redemption factor. In fact there's a call to redeem the banner and the colors from the voodoo in Haiti. And a call to redeem sounds that have been grabbed a hold of by others. I, it's it's really important, and the the one thing that I taught this last week in Haiti is, you know, if it's not in faith, it's sin. Okay, Romans fourteen twenty three says if it's not in faith, it's sin. Okay, that'll really change the way you live if you really apply that across the board. But going further in that, First Corinthians thirteen says you can have the faith in the mountain, but if you don't have love, you know, you're just a clanging symbol. So what are the keys? Love Him first, then love one another. And walk in faith in everything that you use. Say, God, I'm, I'm going to use this eraser to glorify You. Whatever it is. You know, I can make, you know, I can make, make any type of noise. You know, so um, I'm really excited. I loved it, dude. It, it was incredible. If you got questions, Austin's going to be around. Did you bring your CDs, by the way? I have a few, yeah. So he's got some music stuff if you want to pick up some of his stuff. You know. Um, see him, but uh, thank you all for coming. Let's just let's just stand up real quick. And yeah, you can give him a hand clap. So you're going to give me a few notes or something to send yes. out. Okay, Austin's. You all heard it. Austin's going to send me some notes <laughs> to send out to everybody. Make sure your name's on the email list. So Father, we just thank you for tonight, Lord. We just consecrate ourselves to You and, and to pursue more of You. Lord, that we can be used as an instrument of worship. That as we, as we breathe in and breathe out, we breathe in the breath of God. We breathe out Your life into this earth, Lord. Every sound, every heartbeat, everything we do is worship to You, Lord. Help us consecrate our lives to that effect. Lord, I just thank You. Give everybody a safe trip home tonight, Lord. And we just love and honor You. And, and Lord, we just thank You for everything You've done for us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. All right. Blessings, everyone.